an omics recording of the role of office staff in medical malpractice lawsuits. My name is Ann Minke. I have no financial disclosures, and I'm employed as omics patient safety manager. This course is meant for both physicians and staff. And during the course, I'm going to address staff just to acknowledge the important role they play. This is a long list of just some of the roles staff perform in ophthalmic offices and ophthalmic surgery centers. Without their expertise, physicians couldn't continue to provide care. I'm gonna look at some of these important roles in the case studies. The reason it's important to talk about all of these is because if staff don't perform the roles they're asked to in a safe manner, there can be a delay in diagnosis or treatment and patients can sustain injury. They can also file medical malpractice lawsuits, so there's a liability risk if staff aren't properly trained and supervised. Here are some of the allegations plaintiffs can make in a malpractice lawsuit. The most serious one for the physician is the unauthorized practice of medicine. If a task constitutes the practice of medicine and an unlicensed staff member performs it, then the physician may face medical board licensing actions. An example of what can exceed a staff member's authority is to perform telephone screening without written protocols and input, at least on the protocols, from the physician. And we'll look at one of those cases. Some tasks should only be performed with physician supervision. This might include the physician determining that the patient needs the particular test or procedure and reviewing the results of it. Lack of adequate protocols is a frequent allegation in lawsuits and just reminds everyone that physicians need to be involved in protocols to guide the task or procedure performed by staff. The goal of this course is to give you specific indications of ways in which patients have been harmed, provide recommendations on how to prevent that harm and keep patients safe, and how to determine what may be delegated to non-physician staff. I conducted a review of OMIC claims that closed between 2009 and 2019, and the role of staff was a key aspect in 54 of those claims. Here are the issues that emerged, and by far the most frequent one was wrong cases, and I'll look at that in more detail in the next slide. Staff members are often involved in setting up equipment or monitoring its function. They also can be involved in post-operative care. And if that happens with no physician on site, that can be a problem. Staff are very involved in telephone care during the day. They can perform certain procedures that can harm patients and they can be involved in follow-up or more precisely, the lack of follow-up. Let's look at the wrong cases. Many of you may be surprised at the first one, eight claims involving the gas used in retina surgery. In these claims, the nurse made an error diluting the gas and the physician was not involved in verifying the, the gas dilution or the gas type. Solution for contact lenses was the mo second most frequent one and that can cause significant harm. Wrong medication was the third most frequent, and one case that we've presented before but won't be presenting again today involved a technician who was very knowledgeable who was inputting a medication order into the computerized physician order system, and two medications available were very close in name and right next to each other on the system. One of them was just an antibiotic, which was what the physician ordered, the other included a steroid as well. Inadvertently, the technician ordered the combination drug, thinking it was the generic version of the antibiotic-only drug, and the patient remained on this for six weeks, and the condition seriously worsened. Sometimes technicians in a laser or surgery center are asked to input the settings for the laser, and this was done incorrectly in two cases. 
Wrong IOLs are a very frequent type of case. Sometimes the A scan measurements are done incorrectly. Sometimes the wrong orders are sent from the office to the ASC. And sometimes in the ASC, the nurse or scrub technician hands the wrong IOL to the physician. And there was one case of the wrong dye used in retina surgery. Let's look at our first case. This is a patient who presented for a cataract surgery evaluation and was asked to remove her contact lenses. She had her case with her but didn't have any solution, so the technician added wetting solution. The patient was told to wait two hours after the test because a dye had been used. She came back to the office two and a half hours later with complaints of severe burning, swelling, and tearing that began as soon as she put the contact lenses in. Her eye was so swollen they couldn't even open it enough to check her visual acuity. The ophthalmologist's exam showed significant irritation and he diagnosed allergic conjunctivitis. They irrigated her eyes with sterile water and applied Tobradex ointment. She was also given some sample eye drops and told that if the pain continued to use cold compresses. Most importantly, she was told not to wear the contact lens in that eye until her eye healed. She had slow improvement and either was on the phone with the office or seen in the office every day. And fortunately for her, her eye eventually healed. And she was able to resume wearing her contact lenses. Once her eye healed, she went on to have uneventful cataract surgery. Let's look at some risk management issues we're really looking at ways to prevent this from happening to someone else. So what went wrong? Shortly before this patient's visit, AMO had recalled one of their contact lens product called Complete. Complete was a multi-purpose solution. The ophthalmologist told the optical manager to remove all the bottles. The technician needed a solution and found a bottle called Clear Care in the cabinet. It's important to note that both Complete and Clear Care have the same size and were blue bottles. The technician did not notice that Clear Care was meant for cleaning only. We learned that the staff members were not all notified of the recall. And as I mentioned, these were look like solutions stored right next to each other. So to prevent this, in Make sure you notify all staff members and physicians when there's a recall of a product or a medication. Store look-alike solutions and medications separately. And in the cabinet where they're stored, put up a sign. For example, complete is multi-purpose. Clear care is for cleaning only. What seemed to go right in this case? The physician in practice responded really well once they learned of the error. The patient had a good final outcome. The physician apologized for the error, which is a really important step to take, and the practice agreed to waive the fees for the care needed to address the conjunctivitis. This patient went on to file a malpractice lawsuit. Why would she do this? A friend of hers had accompanied her and said to the practice, I hope these visits will be at no charge. The patient was self-employed and unable to work, and the practice did agree to not charge the patient for the care. However, once again, not all staff were informed of this decision, and someone asked the patient for a copayment, which angered her. What should you do for the cost of care after an error? I'm talking about a clear cut error here, not a known complication. First, determine the type of care needed and the likely expenses. Ophthalmologists may offer to waive your own fees as soon as possible after the error. Don't wait for the patient or the patient's family or friend to ask for this. Take this action right away. If you couldn't provide the intended care, again, offer right away to refund the cost. For example, if you couldn't implant a premium IOL and had to put in a monofocal, or if there was a complication early in a refractive surgery procedure and you couldn't complete it. Always clarify when the patient will begin paying again. In this case, you could say, for example, we're so sorry this happened. We're taking action to make sure it doesn't happen to anyone else. And we will, of course, pay, provide the care at no cost to you. However, once we both agree your eye is healed, you will start paying for your care again. 
Should you pay for more? Think about the impact on a patient after an error. How does the injury impact their life, their ability to work? Can they drive? Do they need help with transportation? Do they need to stay in a hotel while they get the care to address the error? If you want to do more than waive your own fees, by policy, you must contact our claims department. Let's look at a little bit more detail. Paying for care provided by others is considered an indemnity payment. This might need to be reported to your state medical board or the National Practitioner Data Bank. So I want to stress that it's very important to contact the claims department. What about lost wages? This patient, remember, was self-employed. She sent a letter six weeks after the event and reminded the physician that he had told her her eye would be fine by the next day, and it wasn't. She had to ask friends to drive her every day to the appointment, and she missed four days of work. And she asked the physician to reimburse her for the amount she would have earned and agreed to pay for it. I'm sorry. So the physician did agree to pay for it after discussing this situation with our claims department. If the patient has an extremely high paying job and is out for a long time, this is probably not something you want to pay for on your own. Contact our claims department and ask them to see if OMIC's policy will pay for this for you. Let's look at another. In this one, this was a patient with poorly controlled diabetes and had developed diabetic retinopathy. She had already had multiple focal laser treatments for this and was getting regular Lucentis injections for diabetic macular edema. Four years ago, she had needed a pars plana vitrectomy because she had developed endophthalmitis. Endophthalmitis is the most serious infection patients can develop after procedures and is much more common in patients who have diabetes. This practice was planning to close for 10 days over the Christmas break. The ophthalmologist who was a retina specialist asked three different comprehensive ophthalmologists to cover during the 10-day period and gave his staff a list of the dates and names. Three weeks after the last Lucentis injection, the patient called in with pain and decreased vision. As directed, the technician contacted the on-call ophthalmologist who was covering. That physician examined the patient and diagnosed iritis, which is an inflammation of the colored part of your eye, and treated her with topical drops. The patient was very concerned about her eye, so called again the next day. She knew there was no physician in the office, but she asked the technician to examine her, and the technician agreed to do so. When she saw the patient, she found a hypopion, which is a sign of either a very serious infection or inflammation. She called a local retina physician, Dr. X. He declined to see the patient despite hearing this history. She finally found a different retina physician to see the patient. He diagnosed severe endophthalmitis and injected antibiotics. Interestingly, Dr. X agreed to take over the ongoing care. This patient went on to sue the retina specialist. And again, surprisingly, it was Dr. X who signed the Certificate of Merit. This is a brief statement of criticism that's required in some states before someone can file a lawsuit. He opined that it was below the standard of care for the ophthalmologist to administer Lucentis without clinical and photographic evidence of active diabetic retinal edema. We asked one of our board members to review this case initially. This retina specialist supported the diagnosis and treatment. He also pointed out that endophthalmitis is a known complication of injections, but he was concerned when he learned more about the physician's injection technique. Apparently, this physician would hold a Q-tip in his mouth prior to covering up the injection site. Our expert felt that this risked spraying oral flora over the injection site, and that could unnecessarily increase the risk for an infectious complication, especially in a diabetic patient. He felt that the staff member had handled the situation extremely well. On the first call, she referred the patient to the physician covering. When the patient was 
concerned and asked to be examined, she agreed. And when she found the hypopion, she worked hard to find a retina specialist. So he was supportive of how the staff handled it, but again was concerned. This was the patient's second episode of endophthalmitis. This was a known history. And he felt that the ophthalmologist should have been more sensitive about the possibility of a recurrent infection in this patient. And that something should have been done to prepare the staff and the on-call physician for this possibility. This raises the uh, uh, question of how can you, when you're going to be away for an extended period of time, help those who will be covering for you handle patients who might be at higher risk. The other question that we asked our initial defense expert to address was whether it was necessary for a retina specialist to cover for a retina specialist. He said there was no strict guideline, but he felt it was prudent. However, he said that the focus of this case was determining whether the patient was harmed when no retina physician was available. He noted that the comprehensive ophthalmologist diagnosed iritis. He felt that most retina specialists would have diagnosed endophthalmitis, a much more serious condition, and that that three-day delay in the diagnosis and treatment did lead to a poorer outcome. When this went on to an actual lawsuit, we hired an outside defense expert. He pointed out that this was an unusual presentation to develop an infection three weeks after the injection, And he noted that the patient had a history of iritis as well as endophthalmitis, and that this supported the comprehensive ophthalmologist diagnosis of iritis. He also felt that the final visual acuity of hand motion wasn't because of the infection, but because of the patient's ongoing diabetic retinopathy. He too, however, was very concerned about the technique. Late in the discovery, we learned something that changed our entire approach to this case. In deposition, we learned that the physician used Lucentis one vial on two patients, and that he continued to do this and bill two patients even after CMS ruled against this. The plaintiff attorney added fraud to the allegations and the defense expert withdrew his support. Since we had no defense expert, and the defendant was near retirement, he agreed to settle the case. This was a very aggressive plaintiff attorney. So we settled the case for policy limits for the malpractice allegations, and the physician had to pay $350,000 out of his own pocket for the fraud allegations. No professional liability policy covers intentional criminal acts. How could this have been handled differently. First, let's look at endophthalmitis claims in general. I did a study of claims from 2006 to 2017, and there were a lot of cases. In fact, this represented 5% of all claims. Slightly more than the usual amount needed a payment to close. So all OMIC claims, we need to pay on about 20% of those, on these 27%. But if you look at the average and middle payments, they're comparable. However, the range of payments was significantly lower in the endophthalmitis claims. Usually this is happening only in one eye, and so the patient still has some useful vision. Some patients can adapt to having vision in only one eye and still drive. The highest payment OMIC has ever paid is $3,375,000, and that was for a retinopathy of prematurity case. The total payments for endophthalmitis claims represented 8% of the payments during that period. This is a chart showing which procedures the patient had before developing endophthalmitis, and there really aren't any surprises here at all. Cataract surgery is the most frequently performed surgery, and it accounted for 45% of the claims. Intravitreal injections have actually exceeded the number of cataract surgeries, but in this study, they represented 23% of the claims. And you can see that there were other types of surgeries, including trauma, sorry, not surgeries, but other types of precipitating events, 
corneal transplants, IOL exchanges, vitrectomies, PRK. Also, it's not uncommon for a patient to develop endophthalmitis after trauma, especially if there's a retained foreign body. And two payments were made to patients who had endogenous endophthalmitis that had spread to the eye. I wanted to look at the difference in how retina specialists and comprehensive ophthalmologists fared. And I included all non-retina specialists in the category of comprehensive ophthalmologists for simplicity's sake. They accounted for 54% of the claims and retina for 37. The treatment issues that came up were the time between the referral and treatment. Sometimes there was a delay because the comprehensive ophthalmologist's office did not handle that referral properly. And sometimes there was a delay on behalf of the retinal physician who didn't uh, decide to do a vitrectomy when experts felt that was needed. So how can you prevent diagnostic delay in patients with endophthalmitis? It may seem obvious, but it's really important to explicitly include this in the differential diagnosis after intravitreal injections and surgeries. If staff are getting calls from patients who report vision loss or pain, they should be instructed to have the patient come in right away. During the history, you should ask about comorbidities that could mask or delay diagnosis, such as diabetes. It's also important to ask if the patient has any other infections. One of these cases involved a patient who had a current fungal foot ulcer and who later developed fungal endophthalmitis. The physician didn't think to ask about foot infections, but he later said that if he had known of this, he would have definitely suspected endophthalmitis. Experts recommended that both eyes be evaluated after dilation and that the ophthalmologist check the red reflex. Both ophthalmologists and staff need to be involved on educating patients on what symptoms to report after procedures and intravitreal injections. Ophthalmologists often need to be away and they do need a break from work. So think about what care might be needed. The practices patients may develop endophthalmitis, and so think about who needs to cover for you. Some comprehensive ophthalmologists can perform intravitreal injections, but they can't provide the definitive surgical treatment for endophthalmitis. So if comprehensive ophthalmologists are covering, you need a retina backup. And as has been discussed earlier, think about how to anticipate patients who are at higher risk. We're often asked, what's adequate coverage for after-hour calls? Does it have to be the same specialty? Can the patient just be instructed to call 911? This might be legally acceptable in some states, but it's not a safe thing to do at all. It costs a lot more money for patients to go to the emergency room, and there might be a long delay finding an ophthalmologist to treat the patient. Think about who should be talking to patients, Make sure staff have written guidelines. And again, stressing the importance of alerting staff and covering physicians to high-risk patients. Let's look at another case. This was a long-term patient treated for glaucoma who was on multiple eye drops. Three months after his last office visit, he called the office and said that his vision was smoky in both of his eyes and had been that way for one week. The staff gave him an appointment for two months later, and the medical record note says okayed by CS, whom we learned was one of the technicians. Two months later, the patient came to his scheduled appointment and had definite decreased visual acuity and very high intraocular pressure in both eyes. He had changes in the cup to disc ratio, and one of them was much paler optic nerves. He was diagnosed with uncontrolled primary open angle glaucoma, and he needed a shunt procedure. So from being controlled on medications, he went to need a very uh, important glaucoma surgery. During the investigation of the claim, the receptionist confirmed that she had agreed to this timing, but we learned that she had not the technician had not spoken with the physician. The physician had no idea this patient had called 
with these complaints. That's a real big problem. You need to include in your written protocols for telephone care the kinds of complaints that you should be told about right away. Both the plaintiff and defense experts felt that this was below the standard of care. They felt that when this patient had these visual complaints, should have been evaluated by a physician. This didn't happen because the physician didn't even know about the complaints, but he was held liable because this was his staff. This two month delay caused progression of the glaucoma and permanent vision loss. The defendant agreed that the system issues made the care difficult to defend and consented to settlement. The patient ended up NLP in that eye. The shunt procedure wasn't effective, and the case settled for $245,000. What did we learn from this one? Remember at the beginning, I said one of the allegations that's particularly serious is the unlicensed practice of medicine. Determining when a patient should be seen is the practice of medicine. Staff may not make independent decisions. They can use written protocols to make these decisions, but those protocols, as I've just said, have to include conditions that should be reported right away to the physician. We have sample protocols on our website that include questions to ask. This is a lot of questions. But if you have your staff use this piece of paper, they can either circle some of the answers, they can fill this out quickly and then scan it into the medical record. Here's an example of the screening guidelines in that document. So we gave categories of emergent, urgent, and routine complaints and what to do about them. And just this is one example. And some, op some ophthalmologists don't consider flashes or floaters to be emergent and put those always in the urgent category. Some felt that it's emergent if the patient has myopia, because patients who are myopic have a long eye and they're at greater risk for detachments. After surgery, again, there's a risk of retinal detachment. Or if the patient has shadows in the peripheral vision along with a recent onset of flashes and floaters. And you can see that if there are no emergent symptoms, Ophthalmologists might want to see patients within 24 hours, and persistent and unchanged flashes and floaters can be given a routine appointment. But patients should always be told to call back if the symptoms worsen before their appointment. Let's look at the next case. This is a new patient presenting to the office for the first time. The patient reported blurry and decreased vision when looking to the side. Importantly, the patient said that both parents had a his history of a pituitary adenoma tumor. The vision was 2050, correctable to 2030. The physician ordered a visual field test to rule out a mass lesion and evaluate the optic nerve. The patient returned one month later for the visual field test and then was lost to follow up and didn't return until five months later and told the ophthalmologist that she had had surgery to remove a pituitary tumor. And she came back upset because she had been told that the neurologist determined the tumor had been there for 10 years. The implication was the ophthalmologist missed the diagnosis. The physician ordered a repeat visual function test. And when this was done, they found the prior test on the machine. It had never been printed. It had never been given to the physician to review and sign and date. No follow-up appointment had been scheduled to review it close in time to the test. And no one had noticed the missing test result or appointment. This was very unusual for this office. Their office protocol was very clear that all those things should have been done. And it wasn't clear why they hadn't been. The defense expert compared those two visual fields and noted that there was a loss of 10% more neurofibers. Moreover, he felt that the ophthalmologist should have had a high suspicion of a pituitary adenoma given the family history and should have sent the patient for an MRI. However, he noted that while the tumor was big, it was slow growing. 
and that the definitive diagnosis was made only three months later. He felt that the patient's difficulty working was due to ongoing endocrine issues, not because of the delay in diagnosis. This is called a causation defense, because in a malpractice case, you have to show both that the care was below the standard of care and that the care given or not given caused the outcome. And by saying that the patient's visual outcome was because of other medical issues, this was helpful to the defense. However, the defendant agreed to settle the case because the patient had lost wages, and so it settled for $189,500. What could have been here? How can you follow up test results and referrals? This is a huge risk, and this is something staff members can really make a difference in. We have some resources that can help you. We have a non-compliance toolkit that has a tracking system for tests and referrals and a tracking system for appointments. There are also sample letters for missed appointments and for patients who refuse to get tested. When you're referring a patient to another physician, we have letters. One, you give the patient explains the condition, the urgency of the referral, and clarifies whether the patient should make the appointment or you should. If this is a high-risk condition, it's best if your office makes the appointment because you're gonna have a better chance of getting through to the other office. There's a letter that you can send to the physician that explains what input you need and again, how urgently the patient should be seen. Key steps are to schedule a follow-up appointment at the same time the test or consultation is ordered, so the physician is sure to get the results and can review them with the patient. You could create a tickler file to track these. Maybe it's an Excel spreadsheet, a log book, or a card file, or you may have a computer tracking system. Always make sure that the results of tests and consults have been reviewed, signed, and dated by the physician before filing them in the medical record. This has happened in many cases where the results were right there and no one gave them to the physician, and so there was no chance of helping the patient. Before the patient comes in for the next appointment, staff should make sure the results are there, either the test results or the letter. If they aren't, contact the patient. Don't take a harsh tone, just say, Mrs. Jones, we know you're coming back tomorrow to see the ophthalmologist, but we don't see the results of your MRI. Did you have it done? And if the patient didn't, explore why. Did they feel better? Did they decide it wasn't necessary? Did they feel that they couldn't have the money to pay for it? If it really wasn't done, talk to the physician and ask him about what should be done next. Let's look at another this is another patient presenting for a cataract evaluation with a history of controlled diabetes and glaucoma. Several years ago, he had had topography and it showed possible form Frust keratoconus. On this pre-op evaluation, the patient had high irregular astigmatism. Nevertheless, he and the physician chose a multifocal IOL and a limbal relaxing incision to treat the astigmatism. On postoperative day one, the vision was slightly worse than pre-op. By postoperative week two, it was significantly worse. The ophthalmologist discussed having LASIK to treat the astigmatism, but worried that the visual quality wouldn't be good. The patient went and got a second opinion, and that physician said, shouldn't have had the multifocal, and you need an IOL exchange. Went to get a third opinion at an academic center. At that time, the vision was 2,400, the patient was diagnosed with keratoconus, so it was an earlier form of it later, and now it's uh, clearly keratoconus, and the same opinion, shouldn't have had a multifocal, you need an IOL exchange. So the patient had the IOL exchange, and the final vision after it was 2,200 with ongoing cystic macular edema. The plaintiff expert who reviewed the case when the patient filed the lawsuit gave several reasons why the multifocal was contraindicated. The 
corneas were thin. There was a history of form first keratoconus, and this was irregular astigmatism. He felt the informed consent discussion was inadequate and felt that without the second surgery needed to exchange the IOL, the patient wouldn't have developed CME. He also said that he felt that this was a practice that upsold premium IOLs to patients who would not benefit from them. Our defense expert had a slightly different opinion. He didn't feel the multifocal IOL was contraindicated, but he said he always gets a current topography to rule out corneal issues. And this wasn't done in this case. He said if the prescriptions was stable and there was a detailed informed consent discussion, he could defend the care. And he felt that the patient would have developed CME regardless of whether he had one or two surgeries. Well, we had an unfortunate surprise during the workup of this claim. Because the defense expert asked us to look again at the informed consent discussion, we looked again at the records and at the sworn testimony of staff and learned that there were late additions to the records. The physician added the information about the consent discussion after the surgery. And the tech, pressured by the ophthalmologist, added documentation stating that she had witnessed the discussion and added a lot of details about it. We felt really badly for her. This is a terrible position to put a staff member in. Obviously, she felt she didn't have the right to say no, that her job was on the line, but this really sank the case for us. It made the case indefensible, and it settled for $500,000. Probably wouldn't have settled for that much if there weren't these problems. Let's look at risk management for this kind of situation. When can you add information to the record? First, if you find an error, you're required to correct it. You can also add information that's needed for current treatment, but you can only do this before you receive notice of a claim or lawsuit, and especially only if it's truthful. CMS has provided guidance on amending records, and I'm gonna paraphrase this. Um, so you have to clearly and permanently identify any change, correction, delayed entry. You have to indicate the date and the name of the person who made the change, and you can't delete any original content, and it has to be really clear what that was. If you have a paper record, you're only allowed to use a single line to strike through the original content, so it's still readable. And again, the author of the change must sign and date it. Electronic records have to clearly identify any addition, correction, or delayed entry, and provide a reliable means to identify who had done it. In malpractice lawsuits, if the medical records are obtained and the computer systems are looked at, it's very clear when these changes were made, and so there's really no way to hide it. We hope this course has been helpful. If you have any questions about it or about your patients, please contact our confidential risk management hotline you may not be able to see the email clearly on this slide, but it's riskmanagement at omic.com. If you prefer to call, use our toll-free number, 800-562-6642, option four, and the resources that were discussed are available on our website. Thank you very much.